the race to fill vacated council seats, D.C.'s first elected attorney general, and the new inspector general is sworn in. That's all straight ahead because Washington Full Circle starts right now. Welcome to Washington Full Circle. I'm Furman Patterson, joined by my co-host, Tamika Felder. First up today, the D.C. Board of Elections and Ethics may be the agency on a lot of speed dials these coming months. What with two vacated council seats, the fast-track campaigns to fill them, and an upcoming special election. Here to break it down for us all is Clifford Tatum, Director of the Board of Elections and Ethics. Thanks so much for coming back to talk to us. Thanks for having me. Now, there is a lot going on right now, but, but set the stage for us. There's an upcoming special election. Why are we having that, and when will it be? Indeed, there is an April 28th, 2015 special election for two contests, Ward 4, uh, member of the council, and Ward 8, member of the council. Ward 4 uh, member, of course, is vacated because of the mayor elect Miro Bowser and the pass in Ward 8, the, the passing of Council Member Marion Barry. So right. uh, the board established a special election date for both of those contests to be held on the same date, and we're going through the petition process now. So everything is pretty much on a fast track because that's very little turnaround time, right? Well, it, it's. It, Generally, when a when a elected official is elevates to the next seat, we know that there will be a vacancy. So, mm -hmm. by the statutes and the calendar, we know that there's at least 144 from 70 to 144, 170 days that we try to establish your election to 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 make it happen as quickly as possible. And do you already have people who want to run for the seat, or can people still apply? to yes. be on the ballot? So the uh, petition process started on December the 8th and will continue through January the 28th. Uh, in both of the wards now, we currently have about 14 candidates in Ward 4 and 15 candidates in Ward 8. So it's, uh, it's a highly interested like contest, and yeah. uh, <laughs> we anticipate a few more will come in before and, the end of the year. And what makes people eligible to run if there's anybody out there watching now and they're thinking, hmm, I could do a good uh, job in uh, that ward? You, you have to be a resident of the ward mm -hmm. and have been a uh, resident for at least one year before uh, you are elected to the seat uh, and a registered voter. And, uh, and the rest is uh, you circulate petitions to get uh, nominated to the ballot, okay. and assuming you can collect enough uh, signatures to get on the ballot, then you're, you're eligible. And of course, Marion Barry's seat was, uh, uh, death was unexpected. But what happens uh, during that period when uh, a council member uh, passes away and before the special election? What goes on with that staff, that office, and everything else? Well, I can't speak specifically to the, to the technicals of, uh, of what's going on in his, in his particular office. Mm -hmm. But once we, the board, receives notice of a death, then the seat by law is, is becomes vacant and the board then announces the vacancy and certifies the vacancy and, the, and establishes the date for conducting the election. Now what kind of things is your office doing right now as far as preparing for election day? So we are uh, processing petitions for candidates, for potential candidates who come in on a daily basis. We walk them through the process, the rules and the regulations for uh, circulating petitions and submitting their signatures to us to, to qualify for the ballot. Uh, we are uh, already preparing the election materials to go to uh, those polling places that will be open on election day. Uh, Ward 4 has 20 polling places, Ward 8 has 17 polling places, and each of those wards will have one early voting center uh, for uh, the early voting period leading up to the election. So we're we're moving ahead now with preparing uh, the, for that, for those particular polling places. And I know you already mentioned there were quite a few people who would be on the ballot. Is there a max number of people who can be on one ballot? No, there's not a maximum. Well, okay. uh, every candidate has to submit uh, at least a minimum of 500 signatures, mm -hmm. uh, and they can submit no more than double that number, so 1,000 signatures mm -hmm. at the most, and we will then review those, uh, we will count those signatures to determine whether or not they've, they've submitted the, the preliminary numbers, and then there's a challenge period where uh, voters, registered uh, voters or candidates can come in and challenge a, a candidate's mm -hmm. eligibility to be on the ballot. So uh, we've had past special elections where we've had at least 
18 candidates on the ballot. So it, wow. there's, there's no maximum number of candidates. Now, the last time we spoke to you was uh, right before the November elections, and there were some new things that you were putting in place, some um, new ways for uh, people to register to vote and things like that. Uh, looking back, how did that all go for you, as, as far as you're concerned? I, I, it went very well. Uh, we, we saw a, a large number of uh, voters who used the mobile app to apply for uh, an absentee ballot to request voter registration. Uh, we saw the numbers on finding their polling place up tick tick up mm -hmm. a bit, and uh, we'll include all of those type of stochastics in our after action report so that the the public can see exactly what those tools did for us. Uh, for this upcoming special election, we are going to roll out a couple of new things. Really? Uh, we're going to pilot a new e poll book solution uh, as well as test a couple of new uh, voting system platforms. You, you may recall our last conversation we talked about the age of our voting equipment mm -hmm. and in our, in our EPO book, so we intend to use this special election to try some new technologies that will help wonderful. the voting process even, even more. Now, what do you see being the biggest challenge between now and Election Day for your office? I think once we get through the petition process, uh, I anticipate that there will be a rigorous challenge process to, uh, to all of these candidates mm -hmm. who are who are applying for these seats. These are two high profile seats that have been vacated mm -hmm. uh, in, in two active wards. So we expect uh, to see a, a vigorous challenge. We expect to see, a, uh, we're hoping for a high voter turnout uh, given that these are two coveted seats. Uh, and you know, we may, perhaps we should challenge the wars to see who will have the highest voter turnout. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and once we get through that process, then it'll be the normal procedures for us. Let's make sure we have the ballot created properly. Let's make sure our voting equipment is working properly. That our uh, v voter registration system is up to date with the number of registered voters and for those eligible candidates, uh, eligible voters. And we do want to remind the voters that only those voters that live in ward four and ward eight can vote in those for those particular right. uh, op offices. No, I mentioned in the opening about being on everyone's speed dial. Uh, are you getting a lot of calls since uh, the mention of the special election? We are. We, we are. When the, the, with the passing of Marion Barry, we received a number of calls almost daily as to what that process would be. And, and our board was very respectful of the fact that he had passed. So mm -hmm. we, uh, unfortunately, by law, we had to take certain steps within a certain period of time, but the board was very uh, concerned about the respect and deference to the right. family as so as not to get out in front of uh, uh, I'm so sorry we run out of time. It's still fascinating. You'll be back another time, I'm All sure. Right, Thanks indeed. for joining us. Uh, coming up, a high-ranking Naval Inspector General takes the helm as the district's government's top internal watchdog. That's next when Washington Full Circle returns. I'm sorry. Welcome back to Washington Full Circle. I'm Tamika Felder here with my co-host Furman Patterson. Daniel Lucas was the U.S. Navy Deputy Inspector General. He now commands the D.C. office tasked with investigating waste, fraud, and abuse in the government. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So give us and our viewers just a little history of your office and the work that you do. Sure. Um, the, the office is probably around uh, 30, 30 plus years old. Um, and it, it has a singular focus and that is to help improve the economy and, and efficiency uh, of the district and its programs and processes. And we do that in a, in a couple of different ways. We've got, I call them tools, where we can look at inefficiency and ineffectiveness in people, process, programs, and agencies. So we've got a plethora of tools we can use to help the government be more e efficient and effective. And who? Yeah, I was just thinking, um, you were Inspector General in the Navy. Uh, yes. What similarities are there between what you did there and what you will be doing in, for the district? Uh, being an Inspector General doesn't matter where it is. Um, if you truly are a student and a professional of the job, 
your sole purpose is to help that agency be the best that it can be. Mm -hmm. So whether you're doing it for the, the Navy, the military, or you know a district you know like uh, DC, it's a singular focus. You want to help in this particular instance, be the, help the district be the best that it can be. Right, right. I'm sorry. Go on, Timothy. No, and I was just I, I was thinking about that. Your experience coming to a city. I think some people look at D.C. and they think federal. They think you know the D.C. doesn't really have this backyard with all these things going on. So how do you make sure that your office stands out? to okay. the, the residents and they understand that they have something just for them? Okay. That is a great question mm -hmm. and it's part of my, my strategy, if you will, uh, since I've taken office. And it is to, to get out and talk to the community. Let them know what the office is all about. Let them know why we exist because I believe I can then leverage the community, uh, government employees, the city council, the mayor to help me do my job. Uh, if I'm not out there talking about my products and services, then I'm, you know, going to be a little introspective and do everything on my own. And that just makes the job difficult. Mm -hmm. And how much independence is there with the Inspector General in, in D.C.? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's complete independence. <laughs> and, uh, and I've made that very clear when I went through uh, my confirmation process uh, and my interview process uh, with Mayor Gray. I simply told them that if they were truly interested in having an effective Office of Inspector General, that independence is paramount. Mm -hmm. However, you can be collaborative and cooperative and still be independent. Sometimes folks get those a little <laughs> twisted, if you will, um, but you can do both and still be effective. And how long is the term for the Inspector General? Six years. Okay, and that's that's different. Generally mm -hmm. it's four years. Why is that special for this, this it, office? It, it's special because you get to carry a mission through two administrations, mm -hmm. at least two administrations. In this particular instance, uh, we, actually, we actually overlap three administrations. But uh, in talking to the city council and even mayor-elect uh, Bowser, she thought that it was a good idea to have someone, you know, that's completely unattached to D.C. come in and give a fresh look, fresh ideas, and help the, uh, the district grow. Now, will this be the first Navy man in that position for Inspector General? It will. <laughs> it will. <laughs> and hopefully not the last. You know, hopefully I can set a precedence uh, where, where folks kind of understand that um, the highest priority of qualification for an individual coming into this job is to be an inspector general. Because when you come with that credential, you know precisely what you need to do in order to get the job done. You're not too heavy in mm -hmm. on law, you're not too heavy in investigations. Your focus is on the whole system of Inspector General. Now, as opposed to, uh, I guess, out having an outlook on the district and sort of uh, policing uh, these areas, uh, waste, fraud, and abuse, or investigating them, wh what's the, uh, what area would you be doing, spending more time in, or do you hope to spend more time in? Well, uh, I'll tell you this, I'm going to be an equal opportunity <laughs> OIG, if you will. Because where I find you put too much emphasis in one area, particularly if it's investigations, what you lose sight of is engagement with all of your stakeholders, so it, which will help you be a little more proactive. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you, if you focus too much on investigation, that means you're in a reactive mode. And you're not doing things that could perhaps prevent you know, bad things from happening in the district. So I plan to take a systemic approach and, you know, be an, an equal opportunity IG where I'm focusing on all my tools and have them ready to bear when and wherever I need them. What do you think the biggest challenge will be? I think the, the, uh, the, the biggest challenge, I believe, at, at this particular point is getting folks used to the notion that an IG can wear a white hat, if you will. I, I that think that's is. a very important one. It yeah. is. Yeah. It, yeah. It really, so and, and I believe it's already having, you know, bearing some fruit because I've talked to some agency heads and members of council and they said, hey, you know, this isn't happening anymore. Mm -hmm. I am so glad, you know, that you've picked up the phone and called me. You know, instead of, you know, kind of walking around and saying, you know, what we're going to do to you. Instead, hey, hey, I, I'm looking at this. How can we make it better? So in a way asking, uh, are we able to do this? Is this 
legal. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Asking first and right. not having to That's explain That's an important later. part of the portfolio mm -hmm. because um, even when I was coming here, you know, you, there's this whole notion, oh, there's the IG. Mm -hmm. Ooh, watch out. Mm -hmm. You know, instead, I want to, you know, set the tone that, hey, there's the IG. Let me share this with you. You're what do you think? You're approachable and we can mm -hmm. problem Absolutely. solve together. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You can leverage the whole entire customer base, if you will, mm -hmm. of the city. Okay. And speaking about the city, what do you like most about this, this city that you're now serving? Diversity. Mm -hmm. Diversity in every way. From its people to its programs That's to actually my favorite everything. Thing, yeah. mm -hmm. You can find anything and everything in, in this city. Okay. And in, in the Navy, where were you stationed? I was curious about that. Where yeah. was I stationed? Yeah, as the Inspector General. Okay, on the Washington Navy Yard is where I did ah. most of my work. Uh, I started off with the Naval Inspector General. He is the, the big Inspector General for the Navy. Served uh, three, three, to three terms uh, in, in, in that office, and then I went over to uh, the Naval Sea Systems Command, mm -hmm. which, um, which is kind of like uh, uh, the district, if you will. Uh, the Naval Sea Systems Command is a very, very complex you know, organization. Mm -hmm. In order to be effective at your job, you have to understand the landscape in which you're operating. Excellent. So I don't see this as, uh, as much different than okay. uh, that particular uh, job. Well, we're running out of time there. Thank you so much for joining us. Up next, political history was made in D.C. as residents elected a new attorney general for the first time ever, and he'll be here in our studio today when Washington Full Circle returns. In November's general election, D.C. voters made history. For the first time ever, residents had the power to select from the ballot the city's new chief legal officer. Well, the voters have spoken, and Carl Racine is D.C.'s new attorney general. Mr. Racine, thanks so much for joining us on Washington Full Circle. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. And uh, my co-host, Tamika Felder, is a big fan of yours. Yes, congratulations on your historic win. Thank you very much, Tamika. Now tell us what's, what's different about this particular uh, election and your office. Uh, some things changed. Yeah, there have been significant changes. Uh, as you noted, this was uh, the first time that the citizens of the District of Columbia were able to go to the ballot and elect an attorney general. Uh, prior to November, the attorney general had always been appointed by the mayor. Mm -hmm. um, Forty-three other states in the union have independent elected attorney generals. And I think what the citizens of the District of Columbia clearly wanted was another check and balance on government. And they wanted to have a lawyer whose opinions and legal judgment on law and ethics would always be viewed as independent. And uh, that's what they delivered. Now, give us an idea. You do have a legal background. Uh, for those who, who didn't get a chance to hear it during the campaign, tell us in, in general what your legal background is. Sure. Uh, very briefly, uh, you know, I'm <laughs> almost a native Washingtonian here in the District of Columbia. My family is from Haiti. We immigrated to the District of Columbia when I was just uh, a tad, three <laughs> years old. Uh, and so I went to school here and went on to a college at Penn and then the University of Virginia School of Law served as a public defender in the District of Columbia, representing uh, kids and adults who could not afford to represent themselves. Um, went on to work at the White House Counsel's Office under President Bill Clinton, and later would become the managing partner of a firm, Venable, uh, here in the District of Columbia. I was the first African-American managing partner of one of the top 100 law firms in the country. An early first. Uh, Very first impressive. First elected attorney general, first in, in your law firm. And, and, and so, with all of that coming behind you, what do you want to be where you sink your teeth into first? Like, what do you want to see happen It's when you take office? Sure, uh, it's an excellent question because there are so many areas uh, that we can you know, mm -hmm. jump into. Um, I think what we learned from the campaign uh, is that the people really want to have an independent lawyer who is looking out for their own interest. So let me give you a couple of examples. In the area of consumer protection, and that's where our most vulnerable citizens, oftentimes seniors, are taken advantage, uh, be it on the internet or by telephone, 
you have debt collection, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, unscrupulous de debt collection services coming after our folks. They want to be protected. And so our office will focus on consumer protection. Another area that clearly our citizens wanted more from in terms of their attorney general was more in the area of criminal justice. Mm -hmm. We have a very important obligation to work hand in hand uh, with the police and making sure that the city is safe. We also have a dual responsibility to make sure that kids who can get services outside of the criminal justice system actually have the opportunity to thrive and become independent without the prospect of going to jail. Now this issue of uh, children and juvenile justice, it's, uh, it's not just with this office, but you have a history of being involved in that area. Tell us about that. Sure, um, indeed. I mentioned earlier that I was a public defender here in the District of Columbia. Uh, one of my areas of focus during my tenure at the public defender was really working with kids, defending my clients, and trying as best I could to persuade the court mm -hmm. that we had remedies for the, for the child that did not include jail. Mm -hmm. and we were quite successful over at the Public Defender Service, relying on services that DC provided to really get us out of the cycle of jail for our kids. And I think we, I know that we're gonna focus real hard on trying to make sure that we reach out to those kids who can benefit from programs that don't involve incarceration. Now, how does your office uh, interact between the district government and the federal government? What will be your role in, in that? It's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an excellent question because, as you might know, the U.S. Attorney's Office here in the District of Columbia, the federal prosecutors, they're responsible for prosecuting adults. We have a sole exclusive jurisdiction over prosecution of juveniles. So there is no doubt that we'll work very closely mm -hmm. with the U.S. Attorney's Office in regards to application of the criminal laws uh, in the District of Columbia, but our focus is going to be very much on children. Now, one of the themes I, I heard during the campaign you mentioned a lot was, uh, uh, was equality and fairness. Um, tell us about what you meant about making uh, the city fair for everyone. Sure. Well, you know, we, we're having extraordinary growth in the District of Columbia, and in many ways, uh, some might view this as the best of times, and there is no doubt that, you know, development is occurring through in all pockets of the city. Nonetheless, uh, as we know, there are, you know, real concerns in regards to um, issues like affordable housing mm -hmm. and other issues of just access to justice. We believe at the Attorney General's office that we have a role to play to make sure that housing requirements are indeed enforced. Um, you know, that we do provide for equal opportunity in regards to the benefits available for affordable housing. So that's what we mean when we talk about equality and justice, certainly in the area of affordable housing. And if there's someone out there watching and they're thinking, I like this new guy, I like what he stands for. I want to get in touch with him. I want him to fight for me. I want him to fight for my ward, my community. Um, what do they need to do to get in touch with you? And very quickly. Very briefly. We're going to be very active out there in the mm -hmm. community. One of the things you're going to see from this elected attorney general is uh, activity in every pocket of the city. Very briefly, go to the website, uh, dcoag.gov, call us. Um, and we're going to be there. We are your advocates. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. We've run out of time. That's it for now. And thanks to all of our guests for joining us today. And thanks to my co-host, Tamika Felder, and you at home for watching. We'll see you again next time.